Hello, antique and vintage fans. I'm George the Antique Nomad. Welcome to my monthly eBay listing party. This is where we put 20 items on eBay. And if you're a level two or three member on my channel, you get to watch these things drop live while you're watching this video, which means you'll be first in line if you see anything you'd like to bid on or buy, or if you're just curious to see how things do in the marketplace. This is why we do these experiments. We take 20 items from different categories every month. We try to bring some things that are a little more interesting or a little more premium or have a good story, talk all about them, and then put them up for sale. Now, if you're not a level two or three member, you can fix that if you like by hitting the join button below or going to the membership in the description of any of my videos. We'd love to have your membership support. We really appreciate the members who are able to do that. But for the rest of you folks, we do let these videos out so that you have a chance to look at these things while they're still active too. So if you're seeing this after the release, well, go take a look. There may still be things available and there certainly will be things that you'll be able to track as they sell on eBay auctions. We do the auctions this time for a 10-day period. So it gives everybody a chance to take a look at these things. And I just have such a good time curating this and figuring out what is interesting and what is different and what are some things that maybe some of you folks haven't seen before. So let's go and show you the stuff that we have for this month. The first piece is not an expensive piece, but a really cool, really fun piece. It is a Golden Age postcard. I did a video early on, very early on. If you look at my earliest playlists, I think sometime within the first six months I was doing videos, I came across a postcard collection, and the thumbnail says, a postcard worth $100. Well, this one is probably not worth 100 but it is really cool, and it is absolutely from the golden era of postcards, which is between about 1907 and about 1915. And this one's really fun because it is proto-surrealist, meaning that it's surreal, but it was done before surrealism was actually a concept in the public imagination. And I love the eyes and the way the stars in the firmament of my happiness are your eyes. So isn't that just the sweetest thing to say? And the wonderful way the clouds and the stars and all of a sudden there's the eyes and the words just floating through space. Surrealism didn't really become a movement until after World War II. It became an art and social movement. But the idea was that you would take things out of their real construct and reimagine them, use parts that don't go together to make other images. Uh, for example, the wording that makes the nose and the lips in this particular postcard. So I just think it's really fun. It's something different. I haven't seen this one before. It has not been used. Sometimes people like to collect them for postmarks and cancellations and stamps and things, but this one never was mailed. And that's not that unusual for early era postcards, because postcards were such a phenomenon when they first came out. It was years and years before they were allowed to be mailed in the first place. And then once they were allowed to be mailed, at first the entire front side had to be blank and you could only write your correspondence on one side. So there were no images. Well, then they decided that they could allow for the address and postage to be on one side and the message to be on the other. And that's when the postcard world just exploded. This is a time when you have uh, chromolithographic processes that are advancing. It's also a time where this is what they call pre-linen. So this is not a linen finished card. They didn't have linen finished cards until about the late teens, early 20s. This one has an artist's monogram in the corner here that you see. I don't know who that is. It's certainly a very distinctive monogram. So if someone out there who's a postcard collector knows, we'd love to find out about that too. It's a cute piece. It's gonna start at a whopping $1.99. It's probably worth five to eight dollars. So we will see who likes this. I sure did. And then our next piece, and I really am fond of this one too. This is an enameled bowl. I've been showing enamel a lot because I got a large selection of Sasha Brostoff from a couple of collections and he did enamel wear, but a lot of other artists did as well. And this one is Anne-Marie Davidson. And I'll show you on the back. It's great because it's got the original tag 
It's got her monogram. It also has the original little store paper that went with it, handcrafted to achieve beauty and uniqueness. And they really were. Uh, Amberie Davidson was actually born in Germany, and her family managed to get out in 1936 and move to New York. And she married a fellow who had various times at different uh, universities, including Harvard. And when he was at Harvard, she started to work with Doris Hall at Cambridge University at the time. And Doris Hall was really well known for enamel work. She was one of the pioneers in the field. And then they got transferred back to Sierra Madre, California, where this piece was made. And in Sierra Madre, she met a gentleman by the name of Curtis Tan. Now, Curtis Tan was a very accomplished enamel artist as well, and he taught her things like jeweling, where you would use enamel in deeper texture so that you get more of a textured finish. Uh, Curtis Tan was interesting because he was actually black, and in California, you could actually get somewhere as an artist. It was unlike the South, and so uh, he was actually celebrated for his enamel work, and she got to work with him. And picked up a lot of really interesting design ideas and was heavily influenced by the two of them. She decided it was time to start making these commercially because people were really knocked out by her designs. So they started the studio at some point in the late 1950s, I believe. But really, we mainly see her de designs in the late 60s and early 70s. And that's why they have this great color scheme that is absolutely the golden green Definitely a 1970s color combination, very rich and jewel toned. And I just love the overlays. You can see where each layer makes the layer underneath it darken. And so you get just a lot of different, with relatively few applications, you get a whole lot of different texture and style and color in there. I sort of see interesting little caterpillars and creatures in it when I look at it. That's part of the reason that this stuff is fun is because it can be just about anything you imagine. This one is unusual because it's a little on the large side and it's a bowl rather than a plate. Plates are definitely more common. It's what we see the most, but this is a nine inch bowl. Uh, so this is a pretty nice piece. I do have a plate that matches it available currently as well. We're going to put this one out at just $9.99, but these typically are selling somewhere in the $50 to $100 range, depending on the response to the pattern and color, and I think this has a great pattern and color. So I'm curious to see who else likes Anne Marie Davidson, but I sure do, and I am definitely looking for her pieces. She's really only, I've, I've seen the pieces over the years, but it's really only registered with me the last year or two that this is somebody we should really be looking for, and now people are. I do have a little bit of jewelry in this flight of objects, and this is the first piece. I'm going to actually put it on so that you can see that even though it's a choker, it actually does fit around my neck. And that's a good thing because usually if something fits my neck, it'll generally fit the uh, average customer. This is 15 inches and these are Murano glass. And I'm going to hold them up so you can see them better. These are actually cased. And you can see that they're cased. In other words, it's sort of similar to the way they make paperweights. So you have the rods of glass in the interior and the interior form, and then they do a clear glass casing around them. So you have all this multicolor, but it's brought together by the fact that it's not just a bunch of random beads. They are all similar in that they have the clear casing on the outside. This is a lot of pastel colors. Around 1960 when this was made, and we can tell it's in the 60s because it has this barrel clasp, this screw-on, screw-off clasp. It's also hand knotted, which is a nice feature because that tells you it was considered good at the time and it was strung well as a result. Interesting thing to me about the multicolored beads around 1960 is they're kind of pastelish. And this was party jewelry. This was spring. And spring was usually the first season after the holidays that the jewelry makers would design for. Uh, so this was intended to be part of a spring line. It's fun in color and they are absolutely very nice quality Murano beads. And it's kind of funny, when you look at Murano beads just individually, new Murano beads like this are being sold for 8 and $10 each. If you multiplied that by the number of beads in this strand, you'd have something like $200. Well, these don't go for $200 strung, so it tells you that it's actually a better deal to buy the strung pieces, even if you were to use it for something else or wanted to lengthen it by adding additional beads to it. 
this would be a cheaper way to get started, especially because we're going to start this out at only $9.99. So that's going to be our opening bid, and we're just going to see where the market goes. Typically, when I sell these at shows, they sell in the $35 to $45 range. So we'll see how they do online. It'll be interesting to compare the online to my real-world experience and see what the difference might be. Or maybe there'll be no difference. Now, this next piece is just so cute and so little. It's only a couple of inches tall, and he's this guy here. He is a cute little frog, and he looks like he wants to sing to you, wouldn't you say? This is by a very, very good ceramic company that operated in Wisconsin, one of the few big Wisconsin makers of ceramics, and this was Ceramic Arts Studio. It's marked on the bottom. If we can get it to come in a little better, there we go. Now you can see it. These pieces were done by a woman named Betty Harrington. In 1944, she and a partner set up a factory in Wisconsin because they saw that the California pottery was really making waves, and they saw that there wasn't anything being made in the Midwest that had the same sort of fun, kitschy aspect, other than what Shawnee pottery was doing. And Shawnee did large things like cookie jars. They didn't do figurals. They didn't do stylish pieces. They just did big, whimsical tableware. So Ceramic Arts wanted to do something different, and most things at that point in the 1940s and 50s, people wanted to buy ceramics in pairs. So finding the little single frog is actually fairly difficult because these were originally meant to be salt and pepper shakers, and that's how they were put out. Not very many were put out as single figures because the demand was for double figures. Uh, it was popular to put, uh, say you had a man and a woman, and you would put the male figure on one side of the bed on an end table and the female figure on the other side. Or you might put them on end tables uh, out in the living room and they wanted a match piece on each side. Uh, so many of the ceramic art studio, the dancers and some of the stuff they made that was really stylish and well detailed was done in pairs. This is a little bit scarcer because it's small and they didn't like to do a lot of small figures. And also because as cute as he is to us today, and people love frogs now and have a different relationship with frogs, but if you think of the old rhyme, sugar and spice and everything nice, that's what little girls are, and boys are uh, snakes and snails and puppy dogs' tails. And that was basically a lot of social programming telling you that girls are supposed to be nice and like nice things, and boys like icky things like snails and perhaps frogs and amphibians and reptiles and things like that. So not a whole lot of women would have been interested in this piece when it was made. So it is a fairly scarce piece. Women were mainly the buyers. But look at the detail. Their glazes were really, really good. And look at all the hand painting on this very small piece. This was not something that they would have made a lot of money on. So they wouldn't have been very motivated to do a lot of these as singles either. So I think it's great that he's a little single miniature. And because I think he's so cool... Well, I'm going to start him at $9.99, and we're going to see who else thinks he's cool, too. But in this era, where men and women both think frogs are really cool and collectible, and nowadays, of course, we realize they're very important to the environment as well, well, there's a different attitude about frogs, and I think this guy's going to find a home. Ah, uh, yes. This is a fun thing, and it was a more interesting story than I imagined. This is a band I always liked when I was young. This is the Kinks. And the Kinks named themselves that because kinky was a new sort of concept. It's a little weird, a little naughty, but we don't really know what it is. So that's what we want, is to be enigmatic and seem a little naughty and a little racy. Well, that and the fact that they were good musicians made them part of the British invasion. And so they had... A tour in 1965 in the U.S. And here's this souvenir song album. Well, the tour did not go very well. It was canceled early. There was fighting within the band, and then there was a literal fist fight between, uh, I think it was um, Ray Davies and the head of one of the unions who called them commies and fairies because they had long hair. Remember, this is 1965. Having even a mop cut like this made you a radical. And so, because of that, they didn't take to that very well. And they just had terrible trouble and ended up 
going home early and were barred from touring in the United States for four more years. So this 1965 folio is actually something a little bit hard to find in this country. And it's a music folio. It has all sorts of stuff from their first album. In fact, it has everything from their first album, all 10 songs. Tired of Waiting for You, this is my theme song, <laughs> or other people's theme song they sing when they're waiting for me. Uh, I'm a little bit bad about punctuality when I don't have to be on time. I often am not. You Really Got Me was their first big hit, and it was a top 10 hit, and it was a little heavier than a lot of stuff, and it led to a whole lot of garage bands in the United States forming, and a lot of bands who became famous as garage bands attribute their interest and their sound to listening to the Kinks. Uh, and a lot of people, even Oasis, says that the Kinks were a big early influence on them. And so the Kinks really were a big deal band. It's a really fun thing to see this for me. And lots of good pictures. Typically sells for around $20. We'll probably put it out at $9.99 again and let someone have a buy it now if they just have to have it. But I thought it was a really interesting uh, story behind them. When I looked into it, I did not realize that the reason we didn't hear more about them with the other British invasion bands is because, uh, well, they got sent home. <laughs> Our next piece has a little bit of an English tie-in, although I did get it in the U.S., and I believe it is an American game. The Whitman Publishing Company. So, yes, in 1957, they got permission to make the Grand National a sweepstakes game of chance. The Grand National to England is the equivalent of the Kentucky Derby in the United States. People who never go to horse races turn out for the Grand National. People who never bet on horses bet on the Grand National. And it's the same with the Kentucky Derby. I'm very excited because I'm going to the Kentucky Derby this year. Uh, so that will be a lot of fun. Uh, this is the English equivalent. It is a very famous race, and so because horses were a big deal in the 50s thanks to the interest in Western, they thought, well, this should sell in the United States, and they did, and they did under various boxes. The box lids changed quite a bit for this game over the years. This one is not one that we see very often from the 50s. It does have everything in there. It's got the horses, it's got the money, it's got the track, it's got the counters, and it's got the betting booth, and it has all the instructions in the lid. The lid has a little bit of wear, as you can see, but generally the graphics are very strong. The lid is not cracked or broken at any corners, uh, so it's a pretty neat game. We're, again, we're just going to have a whole lot of fun. This first group of items I'm showing you are all starting at $9.99, including this one, and we're just going to see where the market is. But typically, and again, I haven't seen this edition sold, but the sold uh, editions that I saw were typically in a $25 to $30 range. So I feel like there's a chance that we're going to see that on it, or maybe a little more because it's an edition people don't often see. While we're on childhood stuff, a lot of people know her and, you know, for all the talk about, oh, the doll market, the doll market isn't very good. Well, this is one doll that really sells, and that is Chrissy. And here is an outfit for Chrissy. This dates to about 1970, and you probably would have guessed that because orange and avocado in the packaging. And you also would have guessed that because Chrissy came out in 1969. The big thing about Chrissy is Chrissy's hair, you could turn a button and it would grow. The early Chrissy dolls, it would grow all the way to the floor. After a while, they realized that was kind of a waste and they would just make it go so you could turn it and it would grow all the way to waist length because long hair was popular in the late 60s and the early 70s. So now we had a doll who could grow long hair. And if you didn't chop it off, then she would still have long hair and you could turn it and you could make a shorter do out of it. So it was a very clever idea. It was very successful. They sold a lot of Chrissy dolls. They ended up developing an entire world around Chrissy. This dress comes with a nice little scarf. It's a nice avocado green color. It's never been out of its wrap. And when you turn it over, you can see all sorts of other groovy fashions that she can wear. So we've got the Drench Trench, which is this one. Uh, and this one does pretty well. It sells typically for around $50. I think that pantsuit is really fun. The mini skirt is very uh, 1970 hippie girl, the grape in the middle there. Uh, so she had lots of stylish outfits. 
and she was quite a fashion plate. And if you have a Chrissy doll or you just like dolls, well, you can have this to make her a fashion plate on a wet day. Now we're getting into something that is of a different caliber than some of the things we've shown you, and it is this really wonderful charger here. It's all done in gold, and it's funny, it's a little darker looking here, and it's darker looking in person, but the light really shows you, so you get a really good view of this dancing nude with the Pfeiffer in the middle of the plate. Uh, this is Rosenthal's Chippendale pattern. Rosenthal did a lot of traditional dinnerware sets. They were very, very good and doing very well as a company in the 1930s. Philip Rosenthal, who was the founder, and his wife were Catholic, but he came from a Jewish family. And because that somehow became known, he got all sorts of pressure to get rid of the company. The board of directors changed so that he couldn't have a vote on it anymore. And he was basically forced out by the Nazis, ultimately Goebbels, came along, the head of Nazi propaganda, and pushed him out, and they essentially expropriated the company. It took until almost 1950 for his son to get the company back into family hands. And when he did that, he started to have studio stylists come in and do a lot of the work. So this is sort of a transitional piece. And we also hear these referred to as chargers sometimes. And a lot of times they would just be hung on a wall or used in service. But it's, it's a very attractive piece, I think. Color is really fun. It's on the large side. Uh, we're going to start this at $99. The actual value is probably closer to the $150 range. And we will see what the response to this is. But I've gotten a large collection of nice European porcelains. And I have to say, much to my pleasure and a little bit surprise, the finer European porcelains seem like they are holding up in the marketplace, and we are finding buyers for these. I think when you have something that is really true, good, high quality, people recognize that, and so the best examples in the line remain popular. This little piece, I have a lot of fun putting things on that are just sort of odd and different, and this was, to me, it triggered a childhood memory. This is an auto altimeter and barometer. And what is that? Well, Taylor was a big company. You see Taylor candy thermometers in a lot of drawers of a lot of estate sales. You see Taylor thermometers hanging on walls in a lot of estate sales. If we take the box out, it's nice that it has the box. The box has one split right there, but otherwise in good shape. And we take it out, and it has never been used. It has all of its original instructions and screws, and there is our little apparatus here. You can see by the way the printing of the word altitude is in sort of a deco modern script that this piece was made sometime around 1950. Now, why would you need an altimeter in a car? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, Cars like Saab's started to become popular in the United States around the 1950s because they were good in snow and they could get to ski areas and skiing started to be a big deal. And so we start to see people going to high country. We also see interest in these amongst people who are doing a lot of high country driving because especially then, not so much now, but cars back then, if you were going from a sea level place above uh, to a place above 4,000 feet, you actually were supposed to take your car into a garage and have it retuned for high altitude where it wasn't getting as much air and there were various things that you were supposed to do. So knowing how high up in the air you were was important. And it also was just fun. I remember in the 1970s, I went on a field trip and Lauren Stumbo's dad in his Volkswagen had one of these mounted. And even though we were really close to sea level, I was just fascinated. You know, we went up into the Olympic Mountains. And I was just fascinated by the idea that we knew how far above sea level we were all the time. And to me, that was really cool. And to somebody who has an old car that they want to restore with lots of fun gadgets and doodads, well, this was an aftermarket thing that could have gone in any car. So I know there's a customer out there for it. I think it's neat looking. You also see the uh, base here, so a little bit of Art Deco there, even though it's a plastic case. So we're right in that transition between Art Deco and Art Modern. And this little piece, 
Again, it's going to start at $9.99, but it's probably a $30 item from what I've seen, and we'll find out what our market thinks of it. Okay, this piece I'm very excited about because I have never owned a piece. I have always liked Bauer Pottery. Bauer was a West Coast company. It was all made in L.A. They became very popular in the early 30s when Victor Hauser started doing their glazes for them, and they did their ring dinnerware pattern, and ring was a huge success, so much so that Homer Lachlan essentially copied the idea to create Fiesta ware, and because of that, Bauer could never get a foothold in the East Coast market, so they decided in 1938 it was time to do something about that, and what they decided to do is they opened a plant in Atlanta. And that's why sometimes, once in a great while, you will see a piece that says Bauer Atlanta. Now this piece, this big vase, is probably part of their floral line. Uh, they did a similar vase that was a lot clunkier looking. I haven't seen this particular shape for sale. You don't see Bauer Atlanta very much. They opened the firm in 1938, two years after Fiesta came out, hoping that if they produced closer to the East Coast, that the shipping would be less, that they could compete better, that they could get more accounts. And I believe part of the reason they picked Atlanta was they also figured they could distribute into the Southeast and Florida, where they knew there was patio living similar to California. Well, Bowers Atlanta factory did not really succeed. The ware is very heavy. It's heavier than the California pottery. This is actually probably eight pounds, I'm guessing, at least six. I mean, it's pretty heavy and substantial, considering it's, it's a nice big vase. It's about 10 inches tall. It's got a great deco feel. The glaze is really good. It's white on the interior, and then the blue glaze is on the outside. And I'm just really excited to see a piece. I got it at the West Palm Beach Antique Show a month ago. And it's the first time I've ever seen a piece there. And it's the first time I've ever owned a piece. So that's why I had to present it. Because it's just not something you see very much anymore. Now where the market is these days, I'm not sure on this piece. Because this piece did not appear in any sold listings that were recent when I went to look, and that's part of why I thought it would be good to put it on eBay and find out. I was fortunate to get it from somebody who really, frankly, I don't think knew or cared what it was, and because of that, we're going to start it at a fairly low starting price of $49.99 and see where it goes from there. But I think it's a beautiful piece, the shape is great, the colors are good, it's substantial, and it's just not something that you're going to find very often. And those are all things that make things interesting to me. And I have to admit, I also like Art Deco styling and the color blue. So for me, that was a winner. And I think someone else will end up winning it too. Uh, another piece of jewelry, since we're talking about flowers in spring, it's time for more spring jewelry. And this little piece definitely fits the bill. It's a nice little flower basket. It has really great textured stones, and it's a little bit three-dimensional because the handle sticks out rather than being just a curve. So this actually has some dimension, as you see when I hold it sideways. This is by a company called Art, and it is signed Art. And I like to mention that because sometimes when you say art jewelry, people think you're referring to street fair jewelry, things that artists made, and some of that can be really great. But no, this is a company called Art. It was originally called Mode Art when it was formed in the 1950s. And Arthur Pepper, hence Art, was the gentleman who started this company in New York. And he called it Mode Art, NYC. And then after 1955, it just changed to Art. They produced until about 1980. This piece is about 1970 because of that really fun hot purple color. The textured stones are absolutely similar to 1970. Arthur Pepper was a big fan of, competitor of, and friend of the people who had the Florenza costume jewelry company. And so you will see some similarities between art and Florenza pieces in really good condition. There's no missing or broken stones. It's Definitely that 1970s revival of 1930s and 40s flower basket pins. And I just think it's a really cute piece. Again, we're going to start this at just $9.99, but we'll probably put a buy it now on this one because I have a feeling somebody might just have to have it right away. 
and spring is almost here. Well, we had a lovely Chippendale Rosenthal plate, and now it's time for something else by Chippendale. But this is a little different Chippendale. This poor fellow obviously lost his clothes and is very dirty and needs to do something about it. His name is Rick Peets. He's actually credited down here. This is from 1990, and it is a wipe-off memo board when this was a brand new idea, when wipe-off memo boards were a new thing. Well, you could just write your message right across him and then have fun erasing it, I guess. It's never been used. It's even got the original pen, which probably dried up years ago. It's got the original hanging stuff. It's even got the original tag on the back. Chippendales is an interesting outfit. I ran into these guys when we were in Las Vegas, and they were out on the street trying to hustle people to go over to the casino that is their home base. The Rio Casino in Vegas is where the Chippendales always perform now. Uh, but they started in a most interesting way. They were actually started by a fellow from India who bought a bar in West Hollywood in 1976, and the bar was not doing well, and he decided that it would be better if he had an exotic dancer night, and he started attracting women to come to the bar because of the exotic dancers, and a few years later, he renamed the bar and the dancers the Chippendales, and this guy is not actually wearing the official Chippendale uniform, which is a bow tie around the neck and collars with no shirt. I, this just amused me, and I thought the Chippendales have certainly been around long enough now that there actually is a vintage aspect to them. The person who started Chippendales did not come to a good end, interestingly enough. He bought three other bars. He got the Chippendales thing going. It was starting to be really successful, but other competitors started to spring up in L.A., and he decided that the way to get rid of them was to have the mob put a hit out on one of them, and he was successful, and he was caught and convicted of racketeering and conspiracy to murder and a whole bunch of other things and was sentenced to prison for 26 years and promptly hung himself in his prison cell. So, the origin story of this is not great, but... Who's thinking about any of that when you're looking at this guy, right? So uh, I think this will be fun and interesting nonetheless. And again, we're going to start this at $9.99. I haven't seen anything for sale by Chippendales that has to do with the dancers. I don't know that a whole lot of other stuff exists. So I just thought that was something different. And you can take him home and help him get clean. Who follows up the Chippendale dancers with a 1840s creamware jug? Well, that's me. This is a really nice syrup pitcher. And what's great about it is it has its original lid. You see the two little points here where they attach. We see these pieces all the time with no lid. All the time when you see these, they have no lid. When you look at the completed sales, they all have no lid. This one has a lid. That apparently is rather unusual for that to have last because it was easy to break those off. And so this is a great piece. You see the apostles in the Gothic arches and you think, oh, Gothic revival. Well, that was way back in the 1840s. Well, that is how old this is. Creamware started in the mid to late 1700s. Wedgwood was one of the progenitors of it. The whole point was that England did not yet know how to make porcelain, and so they were trying to find ways to make earthenware look as close to porcelain as possible. So they started using a lead glaze instead of a salt glaze, which gave it more of this non-shiny effect. That gave it a little bit more of a porcelain look, even though this is earthenware, as you see. This particular piece is by a company uh, called Charles May, and Charles May, his Staffordshire pottery made these pieces around 1840, which was right about the end of Gothic Revival. And they were very popular for a time. So you will see this piece, but like I say, again, you almost always see it without its lid. Very crisp in the design. The molds were very intricate. And a lot of early creamware is very intricate like this. You've got the face up on the top there. You have all the apostles, you have all of these arches, you have all the architectural detail. 
and it's really very clean and crisp. When you think of manufacturing processes in the 1840s, the fact that they were able to make molds this intricate is actually very surprising. So it's a really well-formed piece. It even has the face on the handle. I just thought that this was really neat. You can see it was done in a mold because there's the mold line. It was so popular in England that pretty soon creamware took over most of Europe because it was something that a lot of people could access that had the look of porcelain without the expense at the time of porcelain. So this was considered something very nice in its day. I think it's very nice now. Uh, Charles May's factory lasted till 1902, but these pieces really were only made in the 1840s. Somebody out there will appreciate it. We are starting to hear more and more people talking about liking traditional style, liking things that are truly antique, and missing the fact that they're just nothing like this. Uh, traditional styles like this are not available in new merchandise, and that is actually propelling people to come back to the antique business, which is certainly nice for us. This next folio is just really darling, and this is somebody who I'm surprised I didn't know about, because when I was a kid I definitely liked cats, and I looked for cats, and this person, Claire Turley Newberry, also really liked cats, and she did a lot of illustrations of cats. She got started in the, around 1930, she took a trip to Paris right after school. She'd been to the Art Institute, I think in Portland, Oregon, and done a little bit of studying but hadn't finished. She went to Paris, did a little more study, and then needed to get back to the United States and she needed fare for that, as is right at the beginning of the Depression. So she wrote a little book about a kid who ends up with a lion as a pet. And it was very popular and ended up getting her enough money for her passage back. And that started her on a career where she wrote 17 different children's books, four of which were Caldecott Award winners. And her 1934 book, Mittens, about a boy searching for his lost kitten was one of the first that was really lauded. And so cats became her thing. So it is a whole folio. I believe there are 16 different cats in this folio. This was done in 1956, near the end of her children's author career, as sort of a retrospective and also something that you could buy as an adult. And the inside of the folio has her sketch work, that you can see. And then each page is a different cat with a little bit of information about when she drove and who it was. Illustration from Babit. And that was watercolor and crayon. So that was one of her 1939 books. And so she basically did this whole set Here's this great little cat here. They're really fun. They have almost a Japanese aspect now because they're done singly. There's not really a lot of activity around them in the frame. It's, it's really very sweet, and they really run the gamut. This particular one is an ocelot. She actually had an ocelot as a pet, another really sweet kitten. I just think these are really cute. There's a bunch more. I'm afraid that you'll just have to buy it to see the rest because we could spend all of our time here going through them. And I certainly probably would. I'll show you one more, though. There we go. So these are fun. It's also got a lot of information about her career and why these came to be. These were done in 1956, and these folios typically are selling, again, in a... $40, $50 range for the prints, and then people usually are framing them and selling them for $20 or $30 each. So it's one of those things that sadly is probably worth more split up than together, but I'm selling it together. So someone will have an opportunity to either have it as a collection, or they will have it as an opportunity to frame some pieces and maybe get them to cat lovers elsewhere. Uh, we're starting it again at only $9.99. I decided this month that the things I can start at $9.99, I'm going to because it's fun to just let them ride and see where the market takes it instead of trying to guess what the value should be. One more piece of jewelry, and this is a very good one. We had a very nice Hobane bracelet that sold that was dated 1965. 
I got another piece of Hobe, and this one is really good. This one is Sterling. I've only polished it very little on the high points in order to make sure that there is it's not so black that you can't see the detail, but I wanted to leave a lot of the patina and tarnish so the next person can decide what they want to leave to have the design come out and what they want to polish. I didn't want to dip it and make it all shiny silver bright. This is from the Second World War. This is a period of time when Hobay, who had come over from France, is making things for the American market. He had become very popular with the Hollywood types because he did the costuming for the Ziegfeld Follies, and he was collected by Marilyn Monroe and Ava Gardner and Carol Lombard and a lot of other Hollywood who's who. I'll hold it up so you can see the detail a little bit better. Hobay... Yeah, their slogan in the early years was Jewels of Legendary Splendor, and that might sound like a lot of hype, but for costume jewelry, Hobay was really good. And oftentimes it wasn't just costume. This piece is all sterling, Second World War, and silver was easier to deal with, and you didn't need rhinestones and things we couldn't get from Europe. But they also did some costume jewelry that had semi-precious stones in it, so Hobay is always worth looking for. Here is the Hobay mark on the back. It says Sterling, and the Hobay mark, they've got a patent, and then you see Hobay above it. I just think this is a really great pin. It's large. It's about three inches. These pins usually go for pretty good money online. Well, I'm starting it at 39. I'm not doing any sort of buy it now. I'm going to let the market tell us, but I've seen pieces like this sell for well north of $100. So we will see what people think of it, but I think it's just really a stunner, and it would look great if you can imagine it on a light-colored, like a pastel, and that popping out. I think that uh, people would really notice it. So, nice piece. So, we have three pieces of springy jewelry. Now, we've been talking a bit about World War II, and we talk about World War II a lot. And part of the reason is that, besides being a huge traumatic psychic event for the entire world... It led to so many changes in technology, so many changes in the social order, so many changes in perceptions of male and female roles. I mean, it really changed so much in society beyond the obvious. And one thing people don't realize is that in 1942, yes, we had a draft, and yes, lots of people joined voluntarily, but there were still a lot of America firsters and a lot of uh, people who, for other reasons like religious exemption or that sort of thing, had not joined the war effort, and they needed people, especially in the Navy and the Marines, because those were all volunteers still. They did not start drafting for the Navy until 1943, which is why in 1942 they put this out to try to tempt you. Don't wait! Choose the Navy now! And why do you choose the Navy? Because men make the Navy, and the Navy makes men. So the idea is that you're going to get quick promotions, you're going to have good food. Well, I've had Navy food, so that was a lie. Uh, good shipmates, hopefully. Good pay. You'd learn 49 different skilled jobs. You get expert training and, of course, fighting action. Well, that was guaranteed. It does have a few little creases on it. Otherwise, the condition is good. It's completely intact. And it's got all sorts of information where you can go to the recruiting station. The fact that you could be as old as 50 and join the Navy. And that's unusual because they usually don't want guys in their 50s. It's kind of amazing to think that I could have ended up in the Second World War at the age I'm at now. Fight to keep fit. Keep fit to fight. So they're encouraging you, stay in shape because we might need you. See here, the guy, he was a slumped over... 60-pound weakling, and now he's a man. <laughs> so that's what the Navy will do for you. Uh, interestingly enough, my dad joined the Navy in 1946, right when the war was winding down, and they were actually glad to have him because all these people who were in were done, and they were ready to get out. A great service for your country and for you. It's so interesting to think that even in wartime that they had to put out a propaganda folio like this to get enough people to actually support the war effort. It's got some good pictures. I think it's an interesting piece. Again, I think we're going to start this at $9.99. I did not see this one sold online recently at all. 
I imagine it might be a $25 to $40 piece, depending on who has the interest and how scarce that particular one is. It's got a 1942 date from May, and so that's fairly early in the war. By the 1960s, you would have seen this plaque, probably right around 1970, actually, being made to take to department stores and other places that sell false graph. Well, of course, there's one of these in a store for every thousand pieces of dinnerware they made. So the dealer plaques are actually a lot less available. It has little feet there, so it can stand up like this. It's got the old Falls Graph Castle logo, which was used up until, I believe, around 1970. Falls Graph doesn't get the due that perhaps it should. The Falls Graphs came over in 1811. It was a whole family of potters. They did a lot of local potting and sold things locally, and by the 1890s, it was a big enough concern that they built a factory, and they are one of the few American potters that still has some business in America. They ended up ultimately buying treasure craft, in fact. So at one time, they were a big coast-to-coast -coast concern. Uh, Yorktown and Villager, which are two patterns that uh, some of us YouTubers joke about, that, oh gosh, can you sell that? It's everywhere. Well, it's everywhere because those are both of those patterns are amongst the 100 most popular American dinnerware patterns of all time. So there are collectors of Falls Graph out there, absolutely, and there are older pieces because they go back so far. I think dealer plaques are interesting. You don't see that many of them. I've never seen this one. I can't find a comparable on this one, which is why I thought it would be a good thing to put out there. And we're starting it at $19.99. I've had similar era dealer plaques from other companies that have sold anywhere from $35 to $50, and I'm curious to see how that one does. Well, we had a lot of fun last month selling a Blanco Big Sky vase and it went for over $600 and I thought well I don't want to show another vase I don't want to show something we've already shown in Blanco so I came up with the idea of showing this piece because you don't see these too often but these are Blanco sun catchers and these are the signs of the zodiac and you see the two fish there this is Pisces and these were done with little holes in them on the top and the bottom. So in their catalog, the way they showed them is you had all 12 of them, and you'd hang one from the next from the next and use them as a room divider. And they actually did sell some groups of these, lots of 12s, as room dividers for people. Zodiac stuff was so popular around 1970. It had a little bit to do with the song The Age of Aquarius, which came out in the late 60s and talked about how we were on the verge of a new era where people would treat each other with humanity and, and things would be different. Uh, the Age of Aquarius was supposed to be us leaving the Age of Pisces, and it would be associated with computers and technology and democracy and nonconformity and irresolution. So maybe we are in the age of Aquarius, because irresolution does seem like there's some issues with that right now. Uh, it's argued amongst astrological scholars as to whether the age of Aquarius actually did start around 1970, or if it will actually start in the year 2400 or the year 2600. However, in the year 1970, it didn't matter, because if it was your sign, you had to have it. Asking people what their sign was became a big pickup line what's your sign? And I remember a friend of mine saying, my sign is closed <laughs> to a guy who tried that on her, which I thought was very funny. In any event, it's a great color. It's the peacock blue. They made them in all the different colors that they made at that time. And they're just a lot of fun to collect. If you are a Pisces, if you know a Pisces, it might be fun for them. We're starting it at just $14.99, which is pretty cheap. These usually sell for $35 to $40. And we will see if there is someone from the age of Pisces who feels like that should be part of their collection. Our penultimate piece is a very pretty vase, which I will show you now. This is by a company called Coalport, and look at the depth of that blue. This blue, part of the, the shades of blue is a deep uh, I believe it was called Mazarin Blue, 
this very deep blue you see here. Coalport first used that color for a set of china that they made for Queen Victoria in 1851. She had them display it at the First World's Fair at Crystal Palace in London, and then she gave it to Tsar Nicholas I of Russia as a gift. That was what made Coalport stand apart and become very famous amongst the English makers. They also were not in the Staffordshire pottery region, which was a little bit different. There's our Coalport mark. It says AD 1750. That was a little bit of a stretch. Coalport didn't actually start until the late 1700s, but somehow they convinced everyone they'd been around even longer. Uh, but this gilding was also really something. That mark you saw tells us this is made between 1894 and 1920. And this gold color, this is at the same time that Tiffany is doing gold, Coalport is doing gold on porcelain. Everybody is trying to make things look like precious metals around 1900. It's definitely got that Art Nouveau feel. It's got these great contrasting blue colors. Floral patterns were something that Coalport is really known for. I just think this is a really great little piece. It's a nice twist. You see the twist on the bottom. It's about five inches tall because it's this great color of gold with this great color of blue that's very famous. Pieces in these color combinations often go for big prices. A similarly sized piece with a Chinese style medallion sold for $300 recently in this size. Well, we're not looking for $300. We're actually going to start this at $49, but I think it's really rather exceptional for being on the small side. It sure packs a lot of design and just, mm, it's very luxurious. And as you saw with some of the things I chose for this month's sale, well, we're trying to pay attention to the fact that younger people are saying that they're tired of stripped down and sparse and bare and that they want something with a little bit of design. There's a great example. And speaking of tradition, this last piece, our final piece for this flight, and it's a wonderful piece, is by a company that, while their wear and this piece are not really traditional at all, they have actually been in business in one form or another since 1347. The Seguso family of glassblowers in Venice on the island of Murano have actually been established since before the Renaissance. It's really amazing. And of course, back then, if you were a really good glass blower, you were not allowed to leave the island of Murano because you would have all sorts of trade secrets and then they would have to kill you. And yes, they really would do that. They stayed on the island. Many generations stayed on. Uh, this one has a very nice signature right here that you can just see designed. I think it's just a stunner. I love the fact that it's oval instead of round. I love that it has just a little bit of a cant to it, so it's not just a straight, flat ball base. It's got a little bit of style. It's got a little bit of a lean. It's got motion. I really like the way that they have, and this took a lot of control to alternate the colors so that you get just this little trace of amber between the white and then these clear spaces so that you can see into the piece. This is the sort of thing that's meant to be on maybe a center table where people walk around it and get the feel of it from all sides. I just think it's really astounding, and it's nice and large, too. Uh, this piece is actually 10 inches by 8.5 by 6.5. It's, it's pretty substantial, and it's just, it's just terrific. I really... I like this a lot. The Segusos have pieces that are in MoMA in New York, the Museum of Modern Art. They are shown in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Their stuff is considered really, really fantastic and some of the most desirable mid-century modern glass there is. And for that reason, this one does have a reserve. And yes, I am starting it at $9.99, but this one I need to put a reserve on because it it really has to fetch a certain price, which I suspect there's a good chance it will because there's so much interest in this area of the market right now. 
So that is the group of 20. Please follow along with me as we see how these pieces do. If you are interested in membership information, like I say, click that join button below or look for membership information in the listings and you can be seeing this video when it first drops. So you have first access to these pieces, but whether you're seeing this first run or after the fact, Go to eBay, take a look, you can follow along, you can see what these things have sold for. I like to put this information out there so that everybody can share it and use it, even if you're not a shopper, maybe you're a reseller, and this is how you learn about certain types of things and how they do in the market. So have fun with it any way that you want. It's very good to be with you again, and we shall be back in a few weeks to tell you what's sold and for how much. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also, click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com, for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.